I feel sorry for Ukraine because I don't quite understand all the forces that brought this division, this polarization of the country. From the American point of view, it's simply a button, a leverage point to use to excite the Russians and go after the Russians. So I, I, I would be very worried if I was anybody in the world, a citizen, that the United States is going to use this Ukraine thing at any moment to push the, towards a hot war. The whole world is watching you. That's a fact. They're watching you. Because their hopes for your success you think that was a plan of the Wall Street people, of the Western people, where they wanted to make Ukraine a dumping ground? You know, I don't even have to speculate about it. I'm sure of it. At the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union, many experts reasonably included Ukraine in the top 10 of the most developed countries in the world. Starting positions of the independent Ukraine were impressive. One third of the whole USSR industry, the largest Black Sea shipping company in the world, rocket, aviation, and space industry. As a result, after reckless economic reforms, after breakdown of economic relations with Russia and other post-Soviet countries, Ukraine had a failure. Since independence, its economy has shrunk by a third, ahead of the poorest countries in Europe. After 2014, Ukraine took a sharp turn towards decommunization. Memories of the Soviet time fade one by one. But together with the monuments, Ukraine is parting with its industrial grandeur. Okay, what happens? So Wall Street people make money on this. Does Ukraine become a junk bond? Do they trade the future of Ukraine on stock market? Ukraine, as part of the Soviet Union, was the largest republic in the production of locomotives and diesel locomotives. Deindustrialization in Ukraine led to the fact that we now purchase these diesel locomotives from the United States of America. Who benefits, Mr. Stone? This is beneficial to those who today are lobbying illegal methods, affecting economic integration, the sale of their products. Five years after the Revolution of Dignity, suddenly it became clear to everyone the West is not going to open its sales markets to Ukraine. Nobody needed to have unexpected competitors. It was much more profitable to force the Ukrainians to eliminate their potential. Ukraine used to be one of the few countries that could produce aircraft carriers. Now there is no shipbuilding in Ukraine. Ukraine used to create space rockets. Now it has no space industry, no aircraft industry. Ukraine doesn't have its own automotive industry. The military-industrial complex once brought up to $3 billion annually to the budget. Today, most of the enterprises are closed. Some of the enterprises are located in territory, not controlled by Kiev. Naturally, to say that today we are trying to export these products, these amounts are insignificant, which, of course, cannot come close to what it was before. Because the less we produce, the more we will purchase. That this is one of the elements of this external expansion. An external management that Washington has introduced in relation to Ukraine since 2014. Fantastic. Another amazing experiment over common sense was the coal scam. Ukraine, which has rich coal deposits in the Donbass, has suddenly turned from an exporter into an importer of coal. It seems that in Kiev and Washington, they agreed to give a new meaning to the saying to carry coal to Newcastle. After the start of the conflict in the Donbass, Kiev definitely refused to buy Donetsk coal and decided to replace it with imported coal from the USA and South Africa. It was possible to buy it in Russia, but the politics took over. The second example, Pennsylvanian coal is much more expensive than Russian coal, and it is more expensive than coal from South Africa. And can you imagine the difference in transportation logistics? Ukraine and Russia, Ukraine and the United States of America, and Ukraine and South Africa. At the same time, today we buy 63% of coal imports from Russia. And we already buy 30% of all imported coal from the United States of America. Is this not the result of what you ask about? Is it not the result of who benefits? Who does it? Those who benefit from the sale of their products in Ukraine. In order to avoid domestic production, 
so that the country from the manufacturer turned into the country of the acquirer and the buyer. That's what the benefit is. Is there any uh, oil, gas? There's nothing here. You know, we have oil and gas everywhere, but we do not produce it. It needs to be developed. Therefore, Ukraine is rich in resources. But resources require investments that must be made in the economy of Ukraine in order to extract these minerals. But the situation with the investment and investment climate in the country is extremely bad. The economy is not developing. The investment climate has not been created. There is pressure from the administrative resource. Greater seizure of business. The lack of a fair judicial system. So who would invest? However, there were brave people who decided to invest in Ukrainian oil. The attention of world media is attracted by one company, Burisma Holdings. There are very, very interesting people on the board of directors of Burisma. For example, Hunter Biden is the son of the Vice President of the United States. Of course, this state of affairs is welcome, but one detail interferes. The son of the U.S. Vice President received his post almost immediately after the official visit of his father to Ukraine, in the light of obvious interest of Biden Sr. in everything that is happening in Ukraine. Ex-Vice President Joe Biden, his son Hunter Biden has a deal in Ukraine. Explain that. Yes. His son was and remains on the board of directors of one of the companies that is engaged in oil and gas production in Ukraine. So this also explains the economic interests of the Biden family. Not only the son, but probably his high-ranking father as well. Perhaps this was precisely what allowed Mr. Biden, when he was as curator, when he was in power, curator from the side of Washington in Ukraine. He actually behaved like a person representing not only the country that introduced external management, but it was a representative or leader of the metropolis in relation to the colony, where the colony was, unfortunately, my country. And his speech in the parliament, I remember it very well. Thank you very much. It was not just instructive. It was a speech in which he said what to do and how to do it. And when stating his position, he didn't base it on argument or explanation, but on the fact that this decision was made somewhere overseas. The office of the general prosecutor desperately needs reform. The judiciary should be overhauled. The energy sector needs to be competitive, ruled by market principles, not sweetheart deals. And you, the so-called legislature, before whom he speaks, should implement this policy. Ukraine needs a budget that's consistent with your IMF commitments. Anything else will jeopardize Ukraine's hard-won progress and drive down the support for Ukraine from the international community, which is always tenuous.